Well, good evening, folks, and uh, welcome to our Pine Drive Baptist Church uh, Wednesday evening Zoom meeting, our prayer meeting for tonight, the middle of the week. And um, it, it's been such a beautiful day today, and, and even with all God's beauty, uh, uh, perhaps there's some of us that just need um, uh, to be in the presence of God tonight, so to speak, in a prayer meeting, and uh, maybe hear a word from God, and then... Uh, then we can come before him as we always do on Wednesday evening and just bring all of our praises, our thanksgivings and, and those things that are on our hearts and those people that are on our prayer list that uh, may not even be able to pray tonight because of their condition. And God gives us that opportunity to, to intercede for them. So we're going to talk tonight uh, about a message I titled Empty People who feed on ashes, em empty people who feed on, ashes, feed on ashes. And we see this in Isaiah chapter 44. So there, if you have your, your Bible, turn back there in the Old Testament to, to the big prophet Isaiah there, if you will, the, the big book. And uh, I want to take a look at uh, verses 9 through 20 in just a minute. Uh, I came across a, an article. <clears throat> you know, there's a... Um, I mentioned before we started recording here uh, uh, that there was this about a week ago or maybe a week and a half ago, there was a big boycott of the uh, um, beer company, uh, Anheuser-Busch. And in response to, to their promotion of, of trans women, and it resulted, I mean, in a really big backlash as they were putting this trans woman on, on some of their cans. And their bug light sales plunged 17%. They lost uh, something like $5 million, uh, almost overnight, so to speak. Well, this reminded me of this uh, ad uh, executive that I read about, and his name is Douglas Atkin. And uh, Douglas Atkin notes that transformation has taken place in what's expected of a typical ad executive today at major corporations. This particular uh, ad executive for, uh, for Bug Light is no longer there. She and, and another, uh, her deputy or one of the other marketing people were immediately fired when, uh, when the backlash was, was so intense. And, and Atkins says that uh, rather than being responsible for design and, and packaging, and promotion, a brain manager today in a large corporation is asked, and listen to this, is asked to create a meaning system for people through which they get identity and an understanding of the world. Create a system, create a product through which people can identify and get understanding of the world. And the advertising is asked to induce the advertiser is asked to induce devotion by investing in products with transcendence. And so I can ask himself, as, as this mission came down from higher up, he said, what makes people exhibit cult-like devotion? What makes people join cults or act like they're in cults? They have this kind of devotion that those in a cult has. And so he, has, he undertook a study of cults precisely in order to figure out how brands, to include his brain, could induce loyalty beyond reason. Catch that? To induce loyalty beyond reason. There's no, why is someone so loyal, so dedicated to this particular product? And when he heard people rhapsodize about sneakers or paper plates in terms that he describes evangelical almost, he realized that people joined brands for the same reasons they join cults and they join religions, and that is to belong and to make meaning of their life. And then he said they cease to be merely customers, and now they identify themselves as disciples, as members of the tribe, if you will, whether that tribe is a is Volkswagen or that tribe is Starbucks drinkers or, or Mac users. He said ads for those products do not convey information about them, rather they tell stories, stories with pictures of the worlds of meaning, and they invite them to come in and see this world that is being created for themselves. And he said, he, he concluded this article, he said, the goal of such marketing a very uh, secular documentary 
includes is to fill the empty places where non-commercial institutions like schools and churches might have once done a job, they amount to an invitation to a long-for lifestyle that the church is no longer meeting. And so this is the world that, 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 that we're living in today. And, and never in, in society, if you just think about this, never in society have we been more affluent than we are today and, and had more of everything and anything. And everything is bigger and bigger and it's better and better and it's continuing to get bigger and better. And yet in the midst of all this prosperity, walk well, these masses of empty people. Um, some are, are learning to live behind a successful veneer. They, they put on a veneer they, uh, in order to hide that knowing inner emptiness that they had, that these, these things and these uh, circumstances and these jobs and all these things, they are fulfilling. And among prominent attempts to fill this when some of the other things don't work is they turn to liquor. And we see this today. They turn to liquor, they turn to drugs, they turn to sex. And, and this is what is, is prevalent in, in our society today. But yet it's not true that every person, of every person, if you will, uh, an example, if a person that has high morals, uh, which uh, uh, it's just not gonna permit me, because of my high morals to, to tune into these things, to, to gain relief in my emptiness in life by that way. And there are people who choose another avenue, if you will, to escape uh, a busy life. And, and that's by adding activity to their activity. You've heard the term workaholics or the phrase workaholics. They, they already have a busy life and, and an attempt to drown out the pain of emptiness and meaninglessness, they turn to work more. Look at verse 20 of our text tonight in Isaiah chapter 44, before I read this entire passage, but listen to what the writer Isaiah says in verse 20. He feeds on ashes. He's talking about these empty people. He's talking about these people who are looking for something to fill the emptiness inside of them. He feeds on ashes. A deluded heart has led him astray, and he cannot deliver himself or say, is there not a lie in my right hand? Well, let me read this passage of scripture, and then I, I, I want to talk uh, just about three things, uh, um, how empty people or what empty people do as they feed uh, what the Bible says here on ashes. So read along with me, beginning in verse 9. All who fashion idols are nothing, and the things that delight it do not profit. Their witnesses neither see nor know that they may be put to shame. Who fashions a god or casts an idol that is profitable for nothing? Behold, all his companions shall be put to shame, and the craftsmen are only human. Let them also assemble, let them stand forth. They shall be terrified, they shall be put to shame together. The ironsmith takes a cutting tool and he works it over the coals. He fashions it with hammers and works it with strong arm. He becomes hungry and his strength fails. He drinks no water and is faint. The carpenter stretches a line, he marks it out with a pencil. He shapes it with planes and marks it with a compass. He shapes it into the figure of a man with the beauty of a man to dwell in his house. He cuts down cedars or he chooses a cypress tree or an oak tree and lets it grow strong among the trees of the forest. He plants a cedar and the rain nourishes, then it becomes fuel for a man. He takes a part of it and warms himself. He kindles a fire and bakes bread. He also makes a God and worships it. He makes it an idol and falls down before it. Half of it burns in the fire, the other half falls down, uh, the other half he eats meat. He roasts it and is satisfied. Also, he warms himself and says, aha, I am warm, I have seen the fire. And the rest of it he makes into a God, his idol. And he falls down to it and he worships, he prays to it and he says, deliver me for you are my God. And they know not, nor do they discern, for he has shut their eyes so that they cannot see in their hearts, so that they cannot understand, 
No one considers, nor is there knowledge of discernment to say, half of it is burned in the fire. I also baked, uh, baked bread on the coals. I roasted meat and have eaten, and all shall I make the rest of it in an abom uh, abomination. Shall I fall down before the block of wood? He feeds on ashes. A deluded heart has led him astray. He cannot deliver himself or say, is there not a lie in my right hand? Heavenly Father God, wherever we are tonight, Lord, we know where you are. And I ask Father God, as we look at your word, the word that you uh, inspired Isaiah to write so many years ago, Lord, that uh, perhaps there's a message uh, in our hearts for us tonight individually, or perhaps for a, a message that, that that we can share with someone who may be in a situation in which there's emptiness, a situation in which they could care less about God, um, or, or a situation in, in which they're seeking something that that is not provided to release the joy, the happy that they have experienced. And Father, we just ask, open our hearts, open our minds, God, you speak to us. We are your children, and we are asking you, our Father, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Um, it says the empty man feeds on ashes. And, and I think there's three reasons why the empty man does this. <laughs> Number one, the empty man feeds on ashes because he's committed to a superficial view of life, a superficial view of life. That's kind of what. Uh, this the, this marketing guy w w was trying to get across and and trying to capture others uh, in their world that is not a world of reality but it's a world of falseness and and so he the empty man is committed to a superficial view of life and in other words a distortion his life is distorted it's a, a superficial view it's not a real view. And so the Bible says he feeds on ashes. It's a proverbial saying uh, that's used to refer to something or someone that has no purpose. There's just no purpose. Have you ever asked somebody, what is your purpose? Or what is your purpose in life? Or what is your purpose for doing this? Well, a person that feeds on ashes, somewhere down the road, on this path of life, on their path of life, uh, they took a wrong turn. They began to, to perhaps believe, just for, for the sake of simplicity, they began to believe these ads. But these ads can make you beautiful. These ads can bring you health. These, these ads can, uh, can, can just make you so wonderful and enjoy life so much better. And, and they fell for that. And, and now they're following this very superficial uh, life. And, and they've been filling their life uh, as the Bible says, with temporary things uh, uh, that only concern, the, they're only concerned with the physical. How do I feel? How am I doing? What's, how am I seeing in this life? Well, any view of life that doesn't include God represents a disastrous distortion of life. I'm going to say that again. Any view of God superficial views or whatever, any view of God that doesn't include God represents a disastrous distortion of what life and what reality and the reason that God uh, created us and, and, uh, and, and has blessed us and, and for mo all of us here tonight ha have saved us. So it's a distortion. In other words, the fruits uh, are utter confusion to them. When they see a Christian that's enjoying something or somebody that's happy or or praising God, or going to church, the, the fruits of, of our relationship with Christ, it confuses them. They, they, they don't understand it. Uh, look at verse 6 again. Well, we haven't looked at verse 6, but look back at verse 6 for just a moment. And Isaiah said, Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first, and I am the last. Besides me, there is no God. Well, the Christian realizes that God is the originator of all that he sees. He, he created us. He's created everything. And, and we as Christians realize that. Empty people who feed on ashes don't realize this. They don't understand it. There's, there's uh, some who, who perhaps 
God intentionally hardened their heart. Maybe because they refused to look. Maybe because they had the invitation to look and see the reality of life. And the life that they're living is not real, but Christ is real. And, and, and they just rejected that life. But empty people who feed on ashes, they have a bankrupt philosophy of life. They, they truly don't know what the abundant life, what the life that Jesus Christ died for, that God intended for us to have is. They, they just don't know. Look at verse 14. Um, read that just a moment ago, but verse 14, he's talking about a, a man here who's uh, shaping um, a, a cedar. He says he cuts down cedars or he chooses a cypress tree or an oak tree and he lets it grow strong among the trees of the forest. He plants a cedar and the rain nourishes it. Then it becomes fuel for a man. He takes a part of it and warms himself. He kindles a fire and bakes bread. Also, he makes a god and worships it. He makes it an idol and falls down before it. You see, the church is, is God's divine instrument to bring about his kingdom here on this earth and then his kingdom in eternity. And, and right now, millions and millions and millions of people all over the world, billions all over the world, millions of people in America are, are in bewilderment. They don't understand. Their hearts are darkened. They're, they're, they're into these cults of, uh, of leisure and these cults of, uh, uh, of, of prominence and, and promotion and, and, and all those things today. The empty man supposes that one religion is as good as another religion. And, and he fails, uh, um, uh, fails to see that he is worshiping perhaps not only one God, but he's worshiping many gods in, in this superficial life that he is living in, and, and the image of, of the reality of life that he thinks he has. You know, uh, this man that marks it and, and, and fashions a tree of an idol and he prays to it for deliverance. Verse 17 says, Look what verse 17 says, and the rest of it he makes into a god, and his idol falls down and worships it. He prays it and said, prays to it and says, Deliver me for your God. He's deceived. I can't deliver him from God. None of these things, other than Jesus Christ, other than God, can deliver him, can save him or her. Um and, and and there are those who, who cry out, save me, but they don't know who they're crying out for. There's others that have, have given their life uh, to whatever, to be able to accomplish things so that believing money or whatever will, will satisfy. And, and Isaiah says, it's not gonna happen because you're an empty person. You're living in ashes. So uh, an empty man, Feeding on ashes is committed to a superficial life. There's a second thing about an empty man that's feeding on ashes, according to the word of God. He's committed to a temporary hope. He's committed to a temporary hope. And don't miss this. This empty man's basic fault is not a lack of, of commitment. Rather, he's, uh, his commitment is the short range one. He, he's just committed for the thing that he's, he's uh, committed to right now. It's short range. You know, churches are filled with people um, who commit. But, but too often, people commit in the short range, for the short range. They become bored. They become discouraged. They don't like the passion. They don't like this. They, you know, whatever. They don't like the music, whatever it may be. And, and, and so what do they do? They get discouraged, they get bored, they leave. They want something else. They want something to satisfy them. As the Bible says, they want their ears to be tickled perhaps. But wherever they look and whatever they're looking for or whoever they're looking for to meet their emptiness and their need, they're looking for it somewhere else other than the word of God. And the Bible says, you're not gonna find it. You're living, you're feeding on the ashes of this life. Take a look back at Matthew chapter 10 or up forward to Matthew chapter 10, if you will. Keep your finger in our text and go to Matthew chapter 10. And look at uh, verse uh, 38 of Matthew chapter 10. And verse 38, 
He says, and whoever does not take his cross and follow me, and this is Jesus speaking, and whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake, he will find it. The empty man's basic fault is not a lack of commitment. He's committed to the wrong thing, to the wrong person, to the wrong cult, to the wrong ad, whatever it may be. And so whether you carry, whether you, there, there are so many people that are, are carrying their cross, but there are others who, uh, I guess in, in simple language, they're, they're, they're taking this cross and, and they're chopping it up and they're using it for fuel, such as this man that Isaiah is talking about. They take the cross, they ch chop it up for fuel, they chop it up for satisfaction, they chop it up for comfortable living or comfortable worship. We are a comfortable, unfortunately, Christian church, general Christian church today. Too many are too uncomfortable. And, and one of the blessings or one of the things that we know is when when a Christian gets too comfortable because he's a Christian, because the Holy Spirit's living in him, because the Holy Spirit has a purpose of, of, uh, of growing him, spiritually maturing him into the image of Jesus Christ, that he's going to do something to get that person to feel uncomfortable and, and, and to get with the, the life that God intended for him and the life that Jesus Christ died for him to have. And so... Um, in verse 20 of our text, again, he said, these people are deluded. They're committed to a temporary hope, that temporary promotion, that temporary job, that temporary um, relationship, uh, whatever it may be. And, and they said, they're deluded. And they're, 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 their temporary hopes are, are misleading them. Their life is, is misleading them. You know, it's so, so sad today. And in, in much of our society, and, and I know I'm not telling you anything that you don't already know, but in our society today, it is absolutely sad that some of our churches uh, have chosen to travel um, their travel plan, their, their plan in which they want to take their congregation or, or take their people. And... Uh, you know, they, they plan no other journey. When, when they find at the end of the road, uh, the emptiness that, that these false doctrines, uh, uh, misinterpretation of scripture, both unintentionally or intentionally, it's going to lead in emptiness. It's going to lead in destruction. And they're going to find uh, that they have been feeding on ashes. You know, there are people today, they just want to feel good. Just make me feel good, preacher. Uh, just make me feel good with the message or make me feel good with the, uh, the fellowship in the church or make me feel good with the music. Um, but, but there are those today that want the rich to pay more. There are those today in our society that, that are living in a, a totally false hope. Um, um, we are owed, you owe us, for example, reparations for something. You know, uh, we don't need to work today. We're, we're getting enough. We're, we're happy by not working. We're getting enough from our government to support us. And, and so, you know, they are living in ashes and their life one day is gonna turn to ashes. And there's a commitment and they're committed to a temporary hope. They're not committed to the kind of hope that they would see if, if they knew God, if they knew scripture. And, and it's going to come in time where they're going to be face to face with life, face to face with the living life, with Jesus Christ. And they're going to see that they lived all this time without God. And they never read, I have never read, have you ever read that an atheist uh, a man or a woman atheist, atheist facing death gave a glowing testimony endorsing his way of life or her way of life. Have you ever heard of a, 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 an atheist do that? I haven't. Maybe you have. In other words, they fed on ashes and those ashes are now being reaped by those who are about to leave this earth and go somewhere else, which 
isn't going to be heaven. So remember Ahab the king. Ahab is a, is, is a prime example. Ahab the king of Israel. He was lying in a pool of his own blood when that, that arrow pierced that little chink in his armor. And, 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 and it just uh, brought him death. Uh, it, and, and you know, to, when that little arrow hit King Ahab, it had, uh, it what it did is it not only took his life, but it obscured all those years as the king of all those pleasures, any kind of pleasure that he desired, he had, he had it available there. And in his horror, if you read that entire text, he was dying alone. He was dying alone. Think of COVID, one of the many horrible things about COVID, but one of the horrible things, perhaps the most horrible, is someone dying and their wife, their child, their family, or a child dying, their wife, their immediate, whatever could not be in their presence as they were breathing their last breath, be it a, be it a, a Christian or, or be it someone who was not a Christian. But just think, dying alone, and, and what thoughts, we, we don't know, but what do you think about if you're not a Christian and you know your time is up? What do you think about when, when your family's not there or your loved one is not there and they can't be there with you? So, you know, when we have Jesus Christ in our life, uh, we're, we're not people who feed on ashes. We are people who are feeding on the bread of life. And we know that we don't die alone. Lonely, yes, when you can't see that person, you can't get there in time to the hospital for the last breath, but we know that Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit is there with us, so we don't die alone. Empty people die alone. There's a third thing about feeding on ashes that an empty man or an empty woman does. Uh, in, addition, in addition to being committed to a superficial life and and, and really committed to a, to a temporary hope. And that is a, a, an empty person is committed to a lie. He or she is committed to a lie. Look at verse 20 again in our text. He feeds on ashes, a deluded heart, that's a lie. A deluded heart has led him astray and he cannot deliver himself or say, is there not a lie in my right hand every day? He sees that in his right hand, his hand of strength, it was all a lie. Everything that he did that, that was outside of the word of God that, that, that he strived for, he was just living a life that turned ashes, if you will. And not only is the, uh, the empty man unable to save himself, unable to, he's not even on a minute, unable to admit his greatest defense uh, is not good enough. Uh, it's nothing more than a lie. Whatever defense he tries to bring, whatever defense he tries to bring himself or before God, it's a lie. <laughs> there is only one truth. The way to salvation is through Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross. And so th this is huge that empty people who feed on, on ashes um, they face struggles and they face trials in life as well as death and with nothing more than, as the Bible says, a lie in their hand. They face their struggles. They face their trials, financial, marital, wh whatever it may be. And then they're facing death and all they're facing with is a lie in their hand. You know, today, presidents and, 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 and kings and the universities and, and the media and, and men and, and women uh, behind the pulpits today are feeding on ashes of lies. And they're trying to sell just as, as the, uh, um, the, uh, the Budweiser ad or, or this particular guy creating this ad. Uh, they're, they're feeding on ashes, the ashes of lies and false gods and, and false belief and false benefits and too many people, so many people, multitudes are buying these ads and these, th these beliefs that this is what they need and will take care of the rest of their life. You know, when God ignored, when they ignore God for an idol, such as this in our text or, or many that we know, when they ignore God for an idol, such as money or, or power, 
uh, or position, the Bible reminds us these things. They're nothing but a lie. Wake up. Wake up to the truth. You know, the uh, empty man sees life as an end in itself. And that's really the bottom line. The empty man sees life and he says, what are, here's what I got. This is the time. Um, make everything that you can make. Do everything that you can do. And the truth of life, the battle is in this life is to determine who is to live and who is to serve God is in, in his eternal kingdom. And, and kingdom builders, you and I here tonight, kingdom builders never are empty men or empty women. Empty men and empty women don't build as God's hands, feet, voice, and heart, God's kingdom, and within God's kingdom. So, so many, not just lost, not, not just no relationship with Jesus Christ, but it ought to, it ought to just break our heart. Um, that, that loneliness, loneliness can hit every, I, I imagine every person here tonight uh, has experienced loneliness and, and perhaps that kind of loneliness it just grabs your heart it just hits you in the stomach and and and, and sometimes you just don't want to breathe but when you're a Christian God is there with you and God is going to help you to breathe and when you can't breathe God's going to breathe for you until you can breathe on your own why because he's God He's created us for the fullness of life, not an empty life. He's given us all the blessings that we could ever imagine. He's placed us here in the richest nation in all of the earth. And he gave his son, Jesus Christ, to die for whoever will just accept what Christ did on the cross and open his heart and ask him to come in or ask, ask Christ to come into his heart and to save him and then to help him. Um, to, to help him repent, to help him get rid of th these cult um, characteristics or qualities or things that, that he accrued. And, and with the Holy Spirit living in him, with us being disciples and disciplers, we can help him do that. Empty people, they're all around us. Empty people come to our churches on Sunday. Empty people come to Pine Drive. I don't know if they come every Sunday, but Empty people come and they're looking for something. And it's one of the blessings as your pastor that I have is I see how you respond to anyone who comes and everyone who comes in to our church. And I have a reason, I have a, uh, I have a feeling it's because we have been there and, and we know how terrible loneliness or, or being on the wrong path or, or losing something that is, is dear and important to us can uh, just devastate us if there's not someone to pick us up and, and help us uh, move on. I just finished the book uh, on Charles Stanley's life and I uh, understand there was a, 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 a presentation on YouTube the other night about his life, but uh, uh, one of the lowest points, if not the lowest point of his entire life was not all the fights that he had within the church and people trying to uh, fire him and not hire him and all those kind of things but he had such a deep love for his wife for 44 of uh, 40 years they were married for 40 years and uh, and she divorced him she filed for divorce they went to every uh, uh, every uh, marriage counselor that that they could find they, they went to all kinds of places for help within the church and and um uh, she just, uh, she just couldn't, um, she couldn't stay married to, to Charles. And, and one of the reasons was that that was the moment in, in Charles Stanley's life when they were growing so fast in First Baptist Atlanta that they were, they were either going to have to to move to a larger building, or they were going to have to go to three and even four services. Uh, it, they were just growing by the hundreds and her, hundreds and, and sometimes hundreds a week would join them. And, uh, and at the same time that, that all that was happening, uh, where he was concerned about the church, um, he, was, uh, he was involved with the Southern Baptist Convention. So he was being torn 
um, not torn. He, he was so focused on the jobs that he would be given to do that uh, he just ignored. Well, didn't that that's probably too strong. He he kind of left his wife out of it. And, and she said, I just can't do this anymore. And he said it was one of the loneliest, if not the loneliest time of my life. And then at that time, when the divorce took place, then his son, Andy, um, told him that he didn't do the right thing and he left and started his own church. And so it doesn't matter how much you know about God, how much you preach about God, there are things that are going to come into our life that we have to hold on to. And that is the word of God. We have to be obedient to God and trust that God is going to walk us through this. And, um, and, and many of you, if not all of you, have been there and you know what I'm speaking is true. Thank God none of us are living um, empty people feeding on the ashes of this world today, have everything going around us. So all those things are going to pale in comparison. They're going to be, as Paul said, garbage when that day that we face Jesus. Would you pray with me tonight? Holy Father God, Lord, I used to live in ashes. It wasn't very good. It, they didn't fill me. They didn't feed me. They didn't heal the, the broken heart or the hurt or the anger the disappointment, the discouragement. Didn't help me to, to deal with situations that were, and looking back, they were totally out of my hand. So Lord, I pray, Father God, that um, all the way back here, and you spoke to Isaiah in the Old Testament, that God, we would glean something from that tonight. Maybe it's just a, a recommitment. Maybe it's a recommitment that right now we say, God, I've gotten a little comfortable or God, I've taken my eye off of you, my focus off of you or whatever it is. Thank you for another chance. And Lord, I pray that even in the sound of my voice, if someone hears this online or wherever, God, and they aren't saved, I pray that Jesus Christ that they would call upon Jesus Christ and tell Jesus, this guy was talking about me and I'm asking you, Jesus, to come into my life and save me. Father, we all need encouragement tonight. We are in a battle and we need encouragement. And the enemy is trying to make everything look beautiful if we'll just do it their way. But Father, we know the, the true way. And that is through the cross and that is following Jesus Christ. And that's what we, we, we want to do more than anything in this world, our obedience to you, Lord. Father, thank you for this time. And we pray in Jesus Christ's holy name. Amen.